to our right. Thank you. scissors, a chainsaw, six knitting needles, and a broken whiskey bottle, and the only thing they're going to say to you is that bag has to fit all the way under the seat in front of you. <laughs> and if you didn't take a weapon on board, relax. After you've been flying for about an hour, they're going to bring you a knife and fork. <laughs> they actually give you a fucking knife. It's only a table knife, but you could kill a pilot with a table knife. Might take you a couple of minutes, you know. <laughs> Especially if he's hefty, huh? <laughs> but you can get the job done if you really want to kill the prick. <laughs> Shit, there's a lot of things you could use to kill a guy with. You could probably beat a guy to death with the Sunday New York Times, couldn't you? <laughs> or suppose you just had really big hands. Couldn't you strangle a flight attendant? Shit, you could probably strangle two of them, one with each hand. You know, if you were lucky enough to catch them in that little kitchen area. Just before they break out the fucking peanuts, huh? But you could get the job done, if you really cared enough. So why is it they allow a man with big, powerful hands to get on board an airplane? I'll tell you why they know he's not a security risk because he's already answered the three big questions. Question number one, did you pack your bags yourself? No, Carrot Top packed my bags. He and Martha Stewart and Florence Henderson came over to the house last night. Fixed me a lovely lobster Newberg. Gave me a full body massage with sacred oils from India, performed a four way around the world, and then they packed my bags. <laughs> Next question Have your bags been in your possession the whole time? No. Usually the night before I travel, just as the moon is rising. I place my suitcases out on the street corner and leave them there unattended for several hours. <laughs> Just for good luck. <laughs> Next question. Has any unknown person asked you to take anything on board? Hmm. Well, what exactly is an unknown person? Surely everyone is known to someone. In fact, 
just this morning, Kareem and Yusuf Ali Ben Gaba <laughs> seemed to know each other quite well. They kept joking about which one of my suitcases was the heaviest. <laughs> Another thing they don't like at the airport, jokes. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can't joke about a bomb. Well, why is it just jokes? What about a riddle? <laughs> How about a limerick? How about a bomb anecdote? You know, no punchline, just a really cute story. Or, suppose you intended the remark, not as a joke, but as an ironic musing. Are they prepared to make that distinction? <laughs> Why, I think not. <laughs> and besides, who's to say what's funny? Airport security is a stupid idea, it's a waste of money, and it's only there for one reason, to make white people feel safe. That's all. The feeling, the illusion of safety to placate the middle class because the authorities know they can't make airplanes safe. Too many people have access. You notice the drug smugglers don't seem to have a lot of trouble getting their little packages on board, do they? No, and God bless them too. <laughs> And by the way, an airplane flight shouldn't be completely safe. You need a little danger in your life. Take a fucking chance once in a while. Man. What are you gonna do? Play with your prick for another 30 years? What are you gonna read People magazine and eat at Wendy's till the end of time? Take a fucking chance. Besides, even if they made all the airplanes completely safe, the terrorists would simply start bombing other places that are crowded. Porn shops, crack houses, titty bars, and gangbangs. You know, entertainment venues. The odds of you being killed by a terrorist are practically zero. So I say relax and enjoy yourself. You have to be realistic about terrorism. You've got to be a realist. Certain groups of people, certain groups, Muslim fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, Jewish fundamentalists, and just plain guys from Montana <laughs> are going to continue to make life in America very interesting for a long, long time. That's the reality. Angry men in combat fatigues talking to God on a two-way radio and muttering incoherent slogans about freedom are eventually going to provide us with a great deal of entertainment, especially after the stupid fucking economy collapses. All around you and the terrorists come out of the woodwork and you'll have anthrax in the water supply and sarin gas and the air conditioners of the chemical and biological suitcase bombs in every city. And I say enjoy it, relax, have a good time. To, to me, terrorism is exciting. It's exciting. I think the very idea that someone can set off a bomb in a marketplace and kill several hundred people is exciting and stimulating and I see it as a form of entertainment. I also know that most Americans are soft and frightened and unimaginative people who have no idea there's such a thing as dangerous fun. And they certainly don't recognize a good show when they see one. <laughs> I have always been willing to put myself at great personal risk for the sake of entertainment. And I've always been willing to put you at great personal risk for the same reason. As far as I'm concerned, all of the airport security, the questions, the screenings, the cameras, the searches, it's just one more way of reducing your liberty and reminding you that they can fuck with you anytime they want. As long as you're willing to put up with it. Which means, of course, anytime they want. But that's the way people are now. They're always willing to trade away a little of their freedom in exchange for the feeling, the illusion of security. What we have now is a completely neurotic population obsessed with security and safety and crime and drugs and cleanliness and hygiene and germs. There's another thing, germs. Where did this sudden fear of germs come from? Have you noticed this? The media constantly doing scare stories about all the latest infections. Salmonella, E. coli, hantavirus, bird flu, and Americans panic easily. So now everybody's running around scrubbing this and spraying that and overcooking their food and repeatedly washing their hands, trying to avoid all contact with germs. It's ridiculous and it goes to ridiculous lengths. 
in prisons, and this is true, before they give you a lethal injection, they swab your arm with alcohol. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but they don't want you to get an infection. <laughs> and you can see their point. Wouldn't want some guy to go to hell and be sick. <laughs> Would take a lot of the joy out of the whole execution. Fear of germs, why these fucking pussies. <laughs> You can't even get a decent hamburger anymore. They cook the shit out of everything now because everybody's afraid of food poisoning. Hey, where's your sense of adventure? Take a fucking chance. You know how many people die from food poisoning every year? 9,000, that's all. It's a minor risk. Minor risk. Take a chance. Take a chance. Besides, what do you think you have an immune system for? It's for killing germs, but it needs practice. <laughs> it needs germs to practice on. So if you kill all the germs around you and live a completely <coughs> sterile life, then when germs do come along, you're not going to be prepared. And never mind ordinary germs, what are you going to do when some super virus comes along that turns your vital organs into liquid shit? <laughs> Tell you what you're gonna do, you're gonna get sick, you're gonna die, and you're gonna deserve it because you're fucking weak and you've got a fucking weak immune system. <laughs> true story about immunization, okay? When I was a little boy in New York City in the 1940s, we swam in the Hudson River, and it was filled with raw sewage, okay? We swam in raw sewage, you know, to cool off. <laughs> and at that time, the big fear was polio. Thousands of kids died from polio every year. But you know something? In my neighborhood, no one ever got polio. No one ever. You know why? Because we swam in raw sewage. <laughs> it strengthened our immune systems. The polio never had a prayer. We were tempered in raw shit. <laughs> so personally, I never take any special precautions against germs. I don't shy away from people who sneeze and cough. I don't wipe off the telephone. I don't cover the toilet seat. And if I drop food on the floor, I pick it up and eat it. I eat it. Even if I'm at a sidewalk cafe in Calcutta, the poor section, on New Year's morning during a soccer riot. And you know something, in spite of all of that so-called risky behavior, I never get infections. I just don't get them. I don't get colds, I don't get flu, I don't get food poisoning, and I don't get headaches or upset stomachs. And you know why? Because I got a good, strong immune system and it gets a lot of practice. <laughs> My immune system is equipped with the biological equivalent of fully automatic military assault rifles with night vision and laser scopes. <laughs> And we have recently acquired phosphorus grenades, cluster bombs, and anti-personnel fragmentation mines. So, when my white blood cells are on patrol, reconnoitering my bloodstream, seeking out strangers and other undesirables, if they see any, any suspicious looking germs of any kind, they don't fuck around. <laughs> they whip out the weapons, wax the motherfucker, and deposit the unlucky fellow directly into my colon. <laughs> into my colon. There's no nonsense. There's no Miranda warning. There's none of that three strikes and you're out shit. First offense, bam, into the colon you go. And speaking of my colon, I want you to know I don't automatically wash my hands every time I go to the bathroom, okay? Can you deal with that? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You know when I wash my hands? When I shit on them. <laughs> That's the only time. And you know how often that happens? Tops, tops, two or three times a week, tops. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'll tell you something else, my well-scrubbed friends. You don't always need a 
shower every day. Did you know that? It's overkill. Unless you work out or work outdoors or for some reason come in intimate contact with huge amounts of filth and garbage every day, you don't always need a shower. All you really need to do is to wash the four key areas. <laughs> Armpits, asshole, crotch, and tea. Got that? Armpits, asshole, crotch, and tea. In fact, you can save yourself a whole lot of time if you simply use the same brush on all four areas. <laughs> things that are pissing me off. And this one is in the form of a question. Haven't we had about enough of this cigar smoking shit by now? Huh? When's it gonna end? When is this shit gonna end? When are these fat, arrogant, overpaid, overfed, overprivileged, overindulged, white collar, business criminal, asshole, cocksuckers? <laughs> going to extinguish their cigars and move along to their next abomination. White pussy businessmen sucking on a big brown dick. That's all it is, folks, a big brown dick. You know, Freud used to say, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Oh yeah, well sometimes it's a big brown dick. With a fat, arrogant, white-collar business criminal asshole sucking on the wet end of it. But hey, hey, the news is not all bad for me, not all bad. Want to hear the good part? Cancer of the mouth. Good. Fuck them. <laughs> Makes me happy. It's an attractive disease. It goes nice with a cell phone. So light up, suspender man. Suck that smoke deep down into your empty suit and blow it out your ass, you fucking cocksucker! <laughs> Here's another question I've been pondering. What is all this shit about angels? Have you heard this? Yeah, three out of four people now believe in angels. What are you, fucking stupid? <laughs> Has everybody lost their goddamn mind? Angel shit, know what I think it is? I think it's a massive, collective, psychotic, chemical flashback from all the drugs, all the drugs, smoked, swallowed, snorted, shot up, and absorbed rectally by all Americans from 1960 to 1990. 30 years of adulterated street drugs will get you some fucking angels, my friend. <laughs> Angel shit, what about goblins, huh? <laughs> Doesn't anybody believe in goblins? You never hear about them, except on Halloween, and it's always negative shit, too. <laughs> and zombies, where the fuck are all the zombies? <laughs> That's the trouble with zombies, they're unreliable. <laughs> say, if you're going to buy that angel bullshit, you might as well go for the zombie package as well. <laughs> Here's another horrifying aspect of American culture. The continued pussification, the continued pussification of the American male in the form of Harley Davidson theme restaurants. <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Hey. Harley Davidson used to mean something. It stood for biker attitude, grimy outlaws and their sweaty mamas, full of beer and crank. Rolling around on Harleys, looking for a good time, destroying property, raping teenagers, and killing policemen. <laughs> All very necessary activities, by the way. But now, theme restaurants, and this sort of shit obviously didn't come from hardcore bikers. It came from these weekend motorcyclists, these fraudulent two-day-a-week motherfuckers who have their bikes trucked into Sturgis, South Dakota for the big rally. They truck them in, and they take them off the truck and ride around town like they just came in off the road. Dentists and bureaucrats and pussy boy software designers getting up on a Harley. 
because I think it makes some cool Well, he's, 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 you ain't cool, you fucking chili. <laughs> and chili ain't never been cool. And as long as we're talking about this peculiarly American plague of theme restaurants, I got another proposition for you. I think if white people are going to burn down black churches, then black people ought to burn down the House of Blues. And God damn, what a fucking disgrace that place is. The House of Blues. You know what you ought to call it? The House of Lame White Motherfuckers. Inauthentic, low-frequency, single-digit, lame, white motherfuckers. Especially these male movie stars who think they're blues artists. You ever see these guys? Don't you just want to puke in your soup? One of these fat, overweight, out-of-shape, middle-aged, pasty-faced, baldy-headed movie stars with sunglasses, jumps on stage and starts blowing into a harmonica? It's a fucking sacrilege. In the first place... In the first place, white people got no business playing the blues ever. At all, under any circumstances. What the fuck do white people have to be blue about? <laughs> Banana Republic ran out of khakis. <laughs> the espresso machine is jammed. Hootie and the Blowfish are breaking up. Shit, white people ought to understand their job is to give people the blues, not to get them. <laughs> and certainly not to sing or play them. Tell you a little secret about the blues, not enough to know which notes to play, you gotta know why they need to be played. And another thing, I don't think white people should be trying to dance like blacks. Stop that! <laughs> Stick to your faggoty polkas and waltzes. Of country line dancing shit that you do. Be yourself, be proud, be white, be lame, and get the fuck off the dance floor. Now, as long as we're talking about racial harmony, I want to mention a little something about language. You know, there are always a lot of little expressions and phrases floating through the American vocabulary. They, you hear them in the media, hear them on TV a lot, and people use them up, they get kind of trendy and used up, and, and they get kind of old hat and everything. But anyway, there are a lot of phrases like that and running around in all these cultures, and thanks to the mass media. But uh, there are two in particular I wanted to mention relating to minorities. And these are a couple of phrases that you'll usually hear from guilty white liberals. The first one is, happens to be. He happens to be black. I have a friend who happens to be black. Like it's a fucking accident, you know? <laughs> happens to be black. That's right, he happens to be black. I see, yes, I see, yes. He had two black parents? That's right, two black parents. Yes. <laughs> I see. And they fucked? Oh, indeed they did. Yes. Yes. So where did the surprise part come in? I should think it would be more unusual if he just happened to be Scandinavian. <laughs> and, and the other term you'll hear quite a bit is openly, openly gay. He's openly gay. But that's the only minority you ever hear that one, you know, used for. You wouldn't say someone was openly black. <laughs> well, maybe James Brown. <laughs> Or Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is openly black. Colin Powell is not openly black. Colin Powell is openly white. He just happens to be black. synonymous with the word black. Did I sleep through this eight or nine years ago or something? Urban trends, urban styles, urban music. I was not consulted on this at all. Didn't get an email, didn't get a fax, didn't get a fucking page. That's fine, that's fine, let them go. And I don't think white women should be calling each other girlfriend, okay? Stop pretending to be black. And no matter what color you are, you go girl should probably go. <laughs> Oh yeah, well you 
good at fucking honky. positive, a little more uplifting. This is about a festival. And you can't get much more uplifting than that, can you? A festival. And this is my idea for a new one. One of those big outdoor summer festivals. This one is called Slugfest. <laughs> and this is for men only. Here's what you do. You take about 100,000 of these fucking men. You know the ones I mean, these macho motherfuckers. These strutting, preening, posturing, sweaty, hairy, alpha male jack-offs. <laughs> the muscle assholes. You take about a hundred thousand of these disgusting pricks, and you throw them into a big dirt arena, a big 25-acre dirt arena, and you just let them beat the shit out of each other for 24 hours non-stop. No food, no water, just whiskey and PCP. <laughs> Just let him punch and pound and beat and kick the shit out of each other until only one guy is left standing and you take that guy and you put him on a pedestal and you shoot him in the fucking head. Yeah. Then you put the whole thing on TV. Budweiser would jump at that shit in half a minute, wouldn't it? And guys would love it. Guys would volunteer for it. All you gotta do is promise them a small appliance of some kind. Men will do anything, just give them something that plugs in the wall, makes a whirring noise. They'll be busy in the garage for about a year and a half. And here's another male cliche. These guys who cut the sleeves off their t-shirts so the rest of us can have an even more compelling experience of smelling their armpits. I say, hey Bruno, shut it down, would you please? Yeah, you smell like an anchovy's cunt, all right? because he's got a picture, ah, uh -huh. a little drawing of some wire on his arm. I say, hey, Junior, come around, you have some real wire on there, and I'll squeeze that shit on good and tight for you, okay? <laughs> now, kid, this is the same kind of guy that if you smash him in the face eight or nine times with a big chunk of concrete, and then beat him over the head with a steel rod for an hour and a half, he dropped like a fucking rock. <laughs> Sucks. These t-shirts that say, lead, follow, or get out of the way. I don't know if you've ever seen that. This is more of that stupid Marine Corps bullshit. Obsolete male impulses from a hundred thousand years ago. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. You know what I do when I see that shirt? I obstruct. <laughs> I stand right in the guy's path, force him to walk around me, he gets a little past me, I spin him around, kick him in the nuts, rip off the shirt, wipe it on my ass, and shove it in his fucking mouth. Good time. <laughs> and speaking of tough guys, I'm getting a little tired of hearing that after six policemen get arrested for shoving a floor lamp up some black guy's ass and ripping his intestines out, the police department announces they're going to start having sensitivity training. <laughs> I say, hey, if you need special training to be told not to jam a large cumbersome object up someone else's asshole, maybe you're too fucked up to be on the police force in the first place. You know what they ought to do? They ought to have two new requirements for getting on the police force. Intelligence and decency. You never can tell. Never can tell, it just might work. It certainly hasn't been tried yet. <laughs> no one should ever have any object placed inside their ass that is larger than a fist and less loving than a dildo. <laughs> and speaking of dildos, this next thing is about my president. <laughs> yes, my president. Or as we call him, the dildo-in-chief. 
here's the deal on old Willie. Oh, Willie Jeff, I call him Willie Jeff. You know, you can call him what you like, Willie Jeff, Bill Jeff, BJ's not a bad name for him. A lot of different ways you can name him. But anyway, he, he thought Kennedy was great. He thought John F. Kennedy was just a terrific president, wanted to be just like him. Well, Kennedy's administration was called Camelot. Although it really should have been called Camelot. But that's all he did, he came a lot. So Clinton is looking for a legacy of some kind. Maybe he ought to go with Camilla. Well, maybe come a little would be better for Clinton, don't you think? Oh, yeah, because that's all he did. He came a little on the dress, a little on the desk. Not a whole lot, you know what I mean? Yeah, hey, let me say this. He's no match for Kennedy in the pussy department, okay? You know, Kennedy ain't high. Marilyn Monroe. Clinton showed his dick to a government clerk. There's a drop-off here. There's a really substantial drop-off here. Just one item of complaint left, and uh, after that I'll kind of uh, shift gears and assume a tone of voice that is really no different from the one I've been using so far. <laughs> this is just more of that simple-minded bullshit you have to listen to if you have the media on all the time. And I'm getting tired of all this ignorant shit they're feeding us, and you have to listen to about children. It's all you hear in America anymore. Children! What about the children? Help the children! Save the children! You know what I say? Fuck the children. <laughs> Fuck them. Fuck these kids. They're getting entirely too much attention. And I know what you're thinking. You say, Jesus, he's not going to attack children, is he? <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> he's going to attack children. And remember, this is Mr. Conductor talking. I know what I'm talking about. soccer moms who think you're such fucking heroes aren't going to like this, but somebody's got to tell you for your own good. Your children are overrated and overvalued, and you've turned them into little cult objects. You have a child fetish, and it's not healthy. And I don't, I, you know, I don't want to listen to that weak shit. Well, I love my children. Fuck you! Everybody loves their children. It doesn't make you special. John Wayne Gacy loved his children. Oh yeah, kept them all right out in the yard near the garage. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this constant mindless yammering, this neurotic fixation that suggests somehow everything has to revolve around children. It's completely out of balance. Listen, there are a couple of things about kids you have to remember, okay? First of all, they're not all cute. In fact, if you look at them real close, some of them are rather unpleasant looking. <laughs> and a lot of them don't smell too good either. You ever notice the little ones seem to have a kind of sour milk and urine combination? I don't understand it, but stick with me on this. The sooner you face it, the better off you're going to be. Second premise, not all children are smart and clever. Got that? Kids are like any other group of people. A few winners, a whole lot of losers. <laughs> this country is filled with loser kids who simply aren't going anywhere. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. You can't save them all. You can't. You gotta cut them loose. You gotta let them go. You gotta stop overprotecting them because you're making them too soft. Today's kids are way too soft. For one thing, there's too much emphasis on safety and safety equipment. Childproof medicine bottles and fireproof pajamas and child restraints and car seats and helmets, baseball, bicycles, skateboard helmets. Kids have to wear helmets now for everything but jerking off. <laughs> Grown-ups have taken all the fun out of being a kid just to save a few thousand lives. That's pathetic. That's fucking pathetic. Well, what's happened is these baby boomers, these soft, fruity baby boomers, I've raised an entire generation of soft, fruity kids who aren't even allowed to have hazardous toys, for Christ's sake. Hazardous toys, shit. What about having a natural selection? Survival of the fittest. The kid who swallows too many marbles doesn't grow up to have kids of his own. Simple, simple. Nature knows best. We're saving entirely too many lives of all ages. Nature should be permitted to do its job of weeding out and killing off the weak and sickly and ignorant people without interference from airbags and batting helmets. 
You're lowering the human gene pool. Just think of these ideas as passive eugenics. Now here's another bunch of shit too. Overprotection, an example of overprotection for these kids. You probably notice this on TV. Every time some guy with an AK-47 wanders into a schoolyard and kills three or four of these fucking kids and a couple of teachers, the next day the school is overrun, overrun with psychologists and psychiatrists and grief counselors and trauma therapists trying to help the children cope. Shit. When I was a kid, someone came to our school and killed three or four of us. We went right on with our arithmetic. <laughs> Classmates minus four <laughs> equals 31. We were tough. I say if a kid can handle the violence in his home, he ought to be able to handle the violence at school. <laughs> yes. I tell you, I'm not worried about guns in school. You know what I'm happy about? Guns in church. And it's here, it's here. I predicted this shit a year and a half ago. I did. I said there'd be some Christian yo-yo with a rifle and a Bible. He'll kill eight or nine people and the, the media will call him a disgruntled worshiper. But it's here and I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's not over because the millennium's coming. They don't call them Christian soldiers for nothing, folks. They'll be out there shooting each other. And I'm happy this time it happened in Texas. Texas leading the way once again when it comes to taking human life. Once again, leading the way. One more, uh, no, two more items. Well, anyway, this is another bunch of stupid shit. School uniforms. Bad theory. The idea that if kids wear uniforms to school, it helps keep order. Hey, don't these schools do enough damage making all these children think alike? Now they're gonna make them look alike, too? That's not a new idea. I first saw it in old newsreels from the 1930s, but it was hard to understand because the narration was in German. <laughs> kids in uniforms. By the way, it doesn't work. I'm happy to tell you that. In Florida, in a four-year period, the kids with uniforms had twice as many fights and discrepancy reports. I like that. I like it when the social theorists have to go back to their think tanks and go... <laughs> children, and that is this superstitious nonsense that blames tobacco companies for kids who smoke. Hey, kids don't smoke because a camel in sunglasses tells them to. <laughs> they smoke for the same reasons adults do, because it's enjoyable. It relieves anxiety and depression. And you'd be anxious and depressed too if you had to put up with these pathetic, insecure, striving, anal, yuppie parents who enroll you in college before you're old enough to know which side of the playpen smells the worst. <laughs> then they fill you full of Ritalin and drag you all over town in search of meaningless structure. Little League, Cub Scouts, swimming, soccer, karate, piano, bagpipes, watercolors, witchcraft, dildo practice, I don't know what they're doing. They even have play dates, for Christ's sakes. Playing is now done by appointment. Hey, whatever happened to you? Show me your wee-wee and I'll show you mine. You never hear that anymore. A lot of these parents are burning their kids out on structure. I believe that what every child needs and ought to have every day, three hours of daydreaming. Just daydreaming. Turn off the internet, the computer games, the CD-ROM. Let them look at the fucking train. Thank you very much. It's good, it would be good for them, and every now and then they might even come up with one of their own ideas. <laughs> Never can tell. Anyway, uh, I want to take a moment here of what I call personal privilege. I want to plug something. I don't do that often on stage, only when it's something that's kind of really important to me. And then this is, this fits that category. Um, I want to tell you about, well, let me get a little background in here for you. Some will know about this, some will not know about it, and either way it's okay. Um, I, in the 1970s, I made records for a label called Little David Records and Tapes. I made uh, six albums in the 1970s. Four of them became gold albums. FM and AM, Class Clown, Occupation Fool, and Toledo Window Boxing. A couple of others I had two more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
appreciate that. And then there were two others that didn't quite make it to gold. I think they were ten, some shit like that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I'm lucky that through, through the years I managed to acquire and own all of my own recorded uh, material and all my HBO shows. I got them all. So uh, I'm, we're putting out, that is we, is Atlantic Records and I are putting out a box set. We have a box set of uh, all six of these albums. It's obviously called The Little David Years, 1971 through 79. Thank you very much. Stuff isn't on that, kid. just a little bit later. But this one has everything from those six albums plus a bonus disc. Hey, an extra free complimentary bonus gift free of charge, no cost to you. <laughs> and that is, that is an hour and ten minutes on that uh, seventh little disc, an hour and ten minutes of uh, stuff no one has heard that was from that era and from the era just a little past there toward the early 70s. Uh, these things didn't all fit at that time. LPs would only hold about 45 minutes of spoken word. So we had some very worthy things that didn't get on, put them on the shelf, and by the time the next album came around, you know, you were already on to other things. So these things accumulated and there's an hour and 10 minutes of stuff that uh, no one's ever heard, except in theaters they might have heard them at that time. So anyway, that's uh, the reason I mention this. Not only is Christmas coming, this makes a wonderful first communion gift. I do have one small complaint I'd like to mention, and that is, when I'm flying first class, and some guy from coach comes up and takes a shit in our bathroom, that just really bothers me. I say, get back where you belong to your filthy coach toilet, all of the tampons and children's toys sticking out of the commode and don't be coming up here to our section and leaving your disgusting coach feces <laughs> in our nice, clean, attractive, chemical first-class toilet. Well, I think everybody knows by now that first-class farts do not smell as bad as coach farts. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but it is true. Coach farts are the worst. It has to do with, with income as it relates to diet. Okay? Social, oh yes, I'm telling you, the worse the income, the, the worse the diet, the, the more disgusting the farts, frankly, is what it is. And, and, and any good travel agent will tell you the worst farts in the whole travel industry are in the, the back of the plane, the economy section of any plane coming in from the third world. This is murder, folks. They have farts back there that would kill cancer. <laughs> Especially in the last three rows. What happens is these planes fly so fast that the most vicious farts of all get pushed to the back of the plane where they accumulate and they build up what's called critical fart density. CFD. Now, a lot of terrorists get blamed for explosions that are really nothing more than just spontaneous fart combustion. The whole back of the plane blows off, and the FBI doesn't know this. They don't know what to look for. They're looking for a little, you know, traces of explosives. They should be looking for minute traces of cabbage and broccoli. <laughs> They're just here to help. That's how, I see, that's how I see my role. I come around and help out. These are some of the thoughts that kept me out of the really good schools. Sometimes I like to think about things. I, sometimes I think about, like, the first time certain things happened. You know, because everything had to happen for the first time. Do you ever think about the first enema? <laughs> Somebody had to think of that. Somebody had to think of that on his own. And then he had to explain it to the other people. <laughs> and test it. You have to test. It's only a theory until it's been tested. And you'd want to test it on someone else, I'm sure you wouldn't test it on yourself, you know. But you'd have to be subtle, you'd have to be kind of subtle. Hey, Joey, how are you, man? Hey, hey, turn around, I got a surprise for you. Man. <laughs> no, 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 I just turned around, okay. Yeah. Oh, I dropped my rock, could you pick it up, please? For me, please? <laughs> it's okay, man, you're all right, you're okay. Just take a deep breath, you're okay, it's okay. It's called an enema, you're going to be fine. It'll all run out again about an hour and a half, no sir. Don't worry, I won't tell the other guys. I won't say anything. This will be our little secret, okay? Well, like I say, somebody had to think of it. How, how would it even come into your mind? Why would you even bother having that thought? Isn't it? What's it? Some guy's just sitting there carving a rock or a fertility fetish or something. 
And he says to himself, you know something? I think it would be a really good idea if I would squirt a whole bunch of water up my ass. <laughs> and then just let it all run out. I'll bet I would feel a whole lot better if I did that. <laughs> and it's at moments like that that entire industries are born. <laughs> Colonic irrigation. <laughs> separate categories. <laughs> it's just my everyday all around existential rage. And I don't have a lot of road rage, I'll be honest with you, I do not have a lot of that road rage. I get a lot of my shit out up here and I'm a happy driver. And I'm just driving around looking, having a little fun, looking, looking at the other assholes that are out there driving. I see a lot of interesting folks. Do you ever see one of these guys, somehow he's had an accident on the rear end of his car, so in order to fool the police, he puts red tape where the taillight ought to be. I saw one guy not only had red tape where the taillight ought to be, he had gone to the trouble of putting amber tape where the turn signals ought to be. What are these guys thinking? What are they thinking? That it's gonna light up? I'll bet you with the IQs in my country, there's about a hundred of these guys who honestly believe that if you get going real fast and slam on the brakes, maybe the whole fucking thing will light up, you know? Well, they sure go to a lot of trouble, I'll tell you that. Huh? They must be proud of it. Look at that, Joey, huh? Look at that shit. Perfect fucking like new, man. Like new. Cops will never notice that. Next week, I'm gonna do my headlights. Maybe the windshield, I'm not sure yet. A lot of fun driving, interesting stuff. You ever been, you ever been going through one of these exit lanes where they have a sign that says severe tire damage, do not pack up? Well, even though you know you're going in the right direction, don't you worry about it a little bit anyway? Don't you think to yourself, well, maybe they got it wrong. Maybe some kids switched the signs around. Or maybe the guy who installed the spikes was high on drugs. Or maybe you're high on drugs, and you don't know if you're going backwards or not. <laughs> Which way am I going? I can't tell. Maybe I look at the spikes, I can tell from that. No, I can't see the spikes anymore. Better back up a little. <laughs> then he slams into someone and breaks his tail light. Did you ever run over somebody? So you back up, and you run over him again. <laughs> Did you ever notice the second crunch is not as loud as the first one? Yeah. I think it's because he already has tread marks on him. You know? But there he is, lying right out in the road, right in front of your car. Hey, might as well go over him again. What are you going to do, drive around him this time? Don't worry about this guy, he's not going anywhere. He is not going to testify against you. This guy is part of the fucking road by now. He's already traveling down that long, dark tunnel toward the bright white light. He's shaking hands with his great-grandfather. No sweat. Do what you got to do. Keep moving. Now, I don't usually talk about myself on shows. It hasn't been my style to do that. But there is a traffic incident that I ought to tell you about. And you have to know a couple things about me first. I drive recklessly, I take a lot of chances, I don't believe in traffic laws, and I don't maintain my vehicle very well. <laughs> so as a result, I tend to have a great deal of traffic accidents. And last week, I either ran over a sheep, or I ran over a small man wearing a sheepskin coat. <laughs> and, and I don't know, because I didn't stop. Stop when I have a traffic accident. Do you? Do you? No. You can't. You can't. Hey, who has time? <laughs> These days, who has time? Not me. And I hit somebody, I run somebody over. I keep moving. Especially if I've injured someone. Yes, I do not get involved in that. I'm not a, I'm not a, a doctor. I've had no medical training of any kind. 
I'm just another guy out driving around looking for a little fun, and I can't be stopping for everything. <laughs> well, let's look at it logically. Let's just be logical about it. If you do stop, all you do is add to the confusion. These people you ran over have enough troubles of their own without you stopping and making things worse. Leave these people alone. They've just been in a major traffic accident. The last thing they need is for you to stop and get out of your car and go over to the fire, because by now it is a fire, and start bothering them with a lot of stupid questions. Are you hurt? Well, of course they're hurt. Look at all the blood. You just ran over them with a ton and a half of steel. Of course they're hurt. Leave these people alone. Haven't you done enough? Haven't you at long last done enough? For once in your life, do the right thing. Don't get involved. Well, in the first place, the whole thing is none of your business. None of your business. Simple as that. None of your business. Legally speaking, these people were not on your property at the time you ran them over. They were on the street that is city property. You are not responsible. They don't like it, let them sue the mayor. And besides, the whole thing happened back there. It's over now. Stop living in the past. your blessings, be glad it wasn't you, keep moving. Well, I'll give you a practical reason not to stop. You need a practical reason? If you do stop, sooner or later the police are going to show up. Is that what you want? <laughs> Wasting more of your time filling out forms and answering pointless questions? And by the way, who are you to be taking up the valuable time of the police department? <laughs> These men and women should be out fighting crime. Leave the policeman alone. Stop interfering with the police. And besides, did anyone else see this accident? Are you the only one who can provide information? Surely the people you ran over caught a glimpse of it at the last moment. <laughs> so let them tell the police what happened. They were a lot closer to it than you were. No sense having two conflicting stories floating around about the same dumbass traffic accident. Things are bad enough. People are dead. Time to get moving. You're probably late for dinner as it is. And I'll tell you this, if I am driving around, if I am driving around and I see an accident, one that I'm not involved in, I stop immediately. I want to get a good goddamn look. Well, I enjoy that sort of thing. Someone else has a traffic accident, I want to take a look. I'm never too busy that I can't stop and enjoy someone else's suffering. And I'll tell you this, the bigger the accident, the better it is. Better is, you know my favorite accident? Two buses and a chicken truck. Get hit by a passenger train in front of a church. And I'm looking for something freaky, folks. I want to see a neck coming out of a gas tank. And I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this, if I, if I happen to be in such a position that I can't really see much of what's going on, I'm never too shy to ask the police to bring the bodies over a little closer. <laughs> Officer, would you mind bringing that twisted fellow over a little closer to the car? My wife has never seen anyone shaped quite like that. Look, honey, that's his neck coming out of the glove compartment. That's all, Officer. Thank you very much. We'll be moving on now. You can throw him back on the pile. And I'm off driving around looking for a little fun Perhaps a tanker truck will explode in near a playground. <laughs> yeah. See, they never know what you want to ask. They say, George, you say, yeah, they go. That's okay. That's okay. Don't worry about that shit. Okay. Uh, this next thing is about us. Little intimate information that we all know. Things about ourselves. Things about our bodies. <coughs> you and me know all little stuff. Some of them are disgusting. Some of them are disgusting. Some of them are appallingly revolting and degrading, even to the most degenerate person. So let's start right in with some of them. As I said, these are about our bodies. You know, because everybody's body is different, but everybody's body, really quite the same. So there are a lot of these little things. Do you ever get lip crud? 
If you get that crud on your lip, this is a cold weather area, you must get that lip crud sometimes. Kind of a sticky film, kind of a gooey coating, kind of a cruddy, gummy, flaky, crusty shit kind of thing. Starts in the corner of your mouth, works its way on down your lip, and if it's really bad, the corners of your mouth look like parentheses. Do you ever have that? <laughs> lip crud. And when you want to get rid of it, it's a real simple operation, isn't it? It's low-tech shit. Thumbnail, that's all you need. Simple tool, you scrape that shit off, that's all, you just scrape it on down, that's all you gotta do. Fuck those people at the bus stop. If they know anything, they wouldn't be riding a bus. Fuck them in the mouth, scrape it on down. You scrape that shit, you scrape it on down, and then you take it and you roll it up into a little ball, and then you save that son of a bitch. I save my lip crud. I save everything that comes off of my body, don't you? At least for a little while. Don't you look at things when they first come off of you? Don't you spend five or ten or fifteen minutes studying something, trying to figure out what the fuck it is and what it's doing on you in the first place? Sure you do. You don't pull some disgusting growth off your neck and throw it directly into the toilet. You want to know what the fuck it is. Besides, you never know when you're going to need parts. Isn't that true? Did you ever see these guys on TV? They're in the hospital. One guy's waiting for a kidney. Another guy's waiting for a lung. Fuck you. I've got shit at home. I've got a freezer full of viable organs. I have two of everything ready to go. What do you need? A spleen and a esophagus? How about a nice used ball bag, huh? Come on. Good condition, one owner. He only scratched it on Sundays. Come on, take a chance. I've got everything you need. Well, it's true. You want to know what something is. You don't spend 15 minutes peeling a malignant tumor off of your forehead just to toss it out the window, sight unseen, into the neighbor's swimming pool. Take a good long goddamn look. Holy shit, what is this? Holy crash. Holy jumping fucking Jesus. Look at this thing. <laughs> honey, come here. Honey, look at this. Hey, honey, hey. Hey, fuck the rice a -roni. Get in here, goddamn. <laughs> look at this thing. This was a part of my head a minute ago. <laughs> Not anymore. I pried the bastard off with paint thinner and a Phillips head screwdriver. <laughs> but look at it. Look at the colors in it. It's green, blue, yellow, orange, brown, tan, khaki, beige, bronze, olive, neutral, black, off black, champagne, gold, Navajo, white, turquoise, and band-aid color. Plus, it's exactly the same shape as Bosnia. If you leave out the little section where the Croatians live. I'm not throwing this bastard away, it might become a collectible. Call those people at eBay, maybe we can make some fucking money on this thing. Well, it's just natural curiosity. You all have it. Even if you want to deny it, you do have the curiosity about yourself. You're curious about yourself. You're curious about your body. So you're curious about little parts that come off of you. Toenail clippings are a good example. Toenail clippings, I'll even set the scene for you. Here's the deal. You're sitting on the bed one night at home and something really shitty comes on TV. Like a regularly scheduled primetime network program. You say, well, I'm not watching Raymond Blows the Milkman. I'm gonna clip my fucking toenails. So you start to clip your toenails, and every time you clip one of them, the clipping part flies far away. Do you ever notice that? Boom, boom, boom. These things fly all over the bed. And when you're finished clipping, you have to gather them all back into a little pile, don't you? Yeah, you can't leave them on the bed to make little holes in your legs. You don't need that shit. You wanna gather these things back into a pile. Did you ever notice this? The bigger the pile gets, the more pride you have in the pile. Look at this shit, honey, the biggest pile of toenail clippings we've had in this house since the day the Big Bopper died. Call the Smithsonian Institution, tell them we have a new idea for a major display. And then you look for the largest toenail clipping of all, the biggest one you can find, and you bend it for a while, don't you? Don't you squeeze it and play with it? You have to, you have to. Why? Because you can. Because it's still lively and viable, there's moisture in it, it just came off of your body, it's almost alive. <laughs> you ever try to save your toenail clippings overnight? You ever put them in the ashtray and try to save them until the morning? You can't bend them in the morning, they're too dry. Fuck them, throw them away, who needs unbendable toenails? Not me, bullshit, fuck you, up yours, get laid, eat shit, drop dead, jack me off, I don't need parts that bad, I'm not that sick. I'm not that sick. Little things, little things that come off of you and your curiosity about them, especially if it's something you can't see while it's still on you. Know what I mean? You ever been picking your ass? You know, just idly standing out in the driveway picking your ass. And you come across an object. Off of this? Let me ask you 
ask you something. Did we eat at Roy Rogers' restaurant again? I don't remember ordering anything that smells like this. I believe this is a shit burger. Smells like a hamburger, tastes like shit. Actually, it smells like Waylon Jennings. Call Andrew Lloyd Webber, tell him we have a new idea for a Broadway show. And then bring me the glue, this son of a bitch is going in this scrapbook. Putting it right next to that toe jam we found at the Olympics. Well, you couldn't see it when it was still on you. You couldn't see it while it was still a Klingon. Here's something else you can't see while it's still on you. Little scab on the top of your head. Did you ever have that? Sure, yeah. Little scab, top of your head. Not a big red blood scab like you get when someone at work hits you in the head with a fucking Stilson wrench. Just a little dry spot, a little scaly spot. You find it one day by accident when you're scratching your head. You come across it as if by good luck. Oh, whoa, hot shit, a fucking scab! I love fucking scabs. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to pick off my scab and look at it. Oh boy, oh boy. I'll pick off my scab and I'll put it down on a contrasting material, such as a black velvet tablecloth, in order to see it in greater relief. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to pick off my scab. This will be a lot of wait, 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 wait. It's not ready to come off yet. It's immature, it's still not ripe. It's not ready for plucking. I'll save this for Thursday. Thursday will be a good day. Only have a half a day of work on Thursday. I'll come home early, masturbate in the kitchen. And then I'll watch the Montel Williams show. And then I'll pick off my scab. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to pick off my scab. This is going to be a lot of fun. So you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And you try not to knock it off by accident with a little plastic comb you bought in the vending machine at the motel with the two skanky looking chicks who gave you that clap that night. And now Thursday arrives and it's harvest time. Harvest time on your head. You come home early, you masturbate, but you do it in your sister's bedroom just to get a little extra thrill, you know what I mean? And then you watch the Montel Williams show. Fair show, women who take it up the ass for 50 cents. Not the best show he's ever done, but you know something? Not bad either. And now it's time to get this little scab, but you want to go carefully. You want to pick this thing off evenly and carefully around the perimeter so that it lifts off all in one piece. You don't want it to break into pieces. Who needs a fragmented scale? Not me, bullshit. Fuck you up yours. That lady should drop that jack me off. Suck this. I don't need parts that badly. I'm not that sick. What you really want, what you really need, is a complete whole scab you can put down, study, look at, make notes on, perhaps write a series of penetrating articles for Scab Aficionado magazine. Who knows? You might rise to the top of the scab world in a big hurry. It's a small community and they need people at the top. I sense I've gone too far. <laughs> so I'll quit while I'm even. I'll change the subject. Change of subject. Do you ever blow a horse? <laughs> Not me. Never blow a horse. One time I jacked off a reindeer. Ah, oh, that was Christmas, you know. And we were both a little drunk, to be honest with you. But I will change the subject. I want to talk about names. Names. Simple premise. Five letters, that's all. Easy one. Names. Uh, you see, names are an interest of mine. Not a hobby. Hobbies cost money. <laughs> Interests are free. Mm -hmm. And that's all this is. Just, and I like thinking about names when I hear them and I make up stuff about it. Not always people's names either. Brand names are interesting to me. What's that product? I can't believe it's not butter. Well, I got a new one coming out. It's called, I sure hope the fuck this ain't lard. <laughs> Also, a new instant soup on the market. It's called Make It Yourself, you lazy prick. <laughs> Names interest me. I'm, I'm thinking of moving to Nevada where prostitution is legal and opening a bed and breakfast called the Cock and Muffin. <laughs> Would you go there? You'd come there, I'll guarantee you that. You know, there are some large organizations, and I mean really large organizations, whose names I think are completely mixed up. The Department of Water and Power. Well, water and power don't go together. You get fucking electrocuted. <laughs> the Food and Drug Administration. Well, most drugs, you don't want any food. Except marijuana, and they shouldn't be bothering people with marijuana in the first place. Then you have that really interesting organization, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. <laughs> Do we even have to talk about this one? Bad combination. Here's what they ought to do. 
You call the police, the Department of Power and Firearms. Then you have the Food and Water Administration. That's what you need to survive. Food and water, put them together. That leaves you with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Drugs. Keep all the good shit in one place. <laughs> now, let's talk about people's names. People's names can be interesting. because Sometimes they carry with them a kind of emotional baggage that comes with the name. For instance, Think of the names of the founders of the great religions. Those founders' names still today ring with an air of mystery. Christ, Moses, Buddha, Mohammed. But the Mormons, Joseph Smith, not too impressive. Come on, we're going to Utah. Who said so? Joe Smith. Well, I gotta go take a shit. Drop me a postcard, let me know why you like it out there. Well, I was raised Catholic, and I'm still waiting for a new pope to choose the name Corky. Wouldn't that be fun? His Holiness, Pope Corky the Ninth. Well, I think you have to skip right to nine to give him a little credibility, don't you? Somehow to me, Pope Corky the First doesn't command a great deal of authority. Names do reveal a lot. You'll know the U.S. is in deep trouble if we ever have a president named Booker. Booger or Night Train. You know it's time to dissolve the Electoral College. And sometimes names affect history. History. I honestly believe there never would have been a Second World War if Hitler's first name was Floyd. Can you imagine that? I'm gonna kill 20 million people and take over the world. Remember the name Floyd Hitler. Well, they would have beat the shit out of him in Munich in 1931. Right in the downtown plots. And no one would have been afraid of Jack the Ripper if his name was Wally. <laughs> who's that? Who's on the loose? Wally the Ripper! <laughs> what a fucking goof! <laughs> Wally the Ripper! He's a Ripper! He's a Ripper! He's a Ripper! <laughs> and Billy the Kid. Suppose his name was Billy the Schmuck. <laughs> People would have been a lot less tense. Who's that riding in the town? Well, that's Billy the Schmuck. Ah, uh, well, fuck him. And I know I never would have gone hunting with Buffalo Shecky. Doesn't sound safe. Suppose, suppose there had been a great composer living in the 18th century, but I mean great, better than all the rest. Better than Bach, better than Beethoven, better than Mozart, but his name was Johann the Cutlapper. <laughs> Do you think they would play his music on the radio today? And now the New York Philharmonic performs the Easter Mass in C-sharp minor by Johann the Cutlapper. <laughs> Considered Johann's finest work, it had a profound influence on another obscure composer of that era, Heinrich the Mulefucker. <laughs> Some people have dirty names. They can't help it, they have a dirty name. Think all those dicks and peters running around you. Dick Ball, Peter Cox, nah. In fact, some of you might know this, there's actually a NASCAR race driver whose name is Dick Trickle. I swear that's his name, Dick Trickle. Well, how do you go through life like that? Hi, I'm Dick Trickle. Fine, stand over there. Off the carpet, off the carpet. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Trickle. Here's a milk bottle. Will that help you a little bit? Well, they look like good moccasins to me. But having your dick trickle is not nearly as impressive as having a Magic Johnson. <laughs> God damn, you frightened the dog. If I was you, Mr. Johnson, I'd put that thing away a little at a time. You know, you wouldn't want to go and get a big knot in it, would you? And Peter O'Toole. That's a double header, isn't it? Hey, if you're the Doubleman twins, don't bend over near Peter O'Toole. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, some people have funny names. They can't help it, they have a funny name. Do you realize Howdy Doody's mother and father are known as the Doody's? It's true, Rudy and Judy Doody. 
that Bo Diddley's mother and father are the Diddleys. Gotti and Dudley Diddley. Well, how would you like to be at a party and have to introduce the duties to the Diddleys? Uh, Rudy Doody, like to meet Dottie Diddley, Dottie Diddley, Judy Doody, Judy Doody, Dottie Diddley, Dottie Diddley, Rudy Doody, the duties of Diddley Diddley. Because by the time you get finished with those four people, who shows up? Howdy Doody's two sisters, Dee Dee Doody and Doody Doody. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd be drinking triple whiskeys and saying, please God, don't let fucking Rudy Kazooty show up tonight. <laughs> and didn't they have any funny names in the Old West? Was everybody out there really named Murdoch and Kincaid? Didn't they have any funny names? Hey, Dan, Dan, guess who's over to Saloon getting all liquored up? Two-Gun Flechtenberger. <laughs> Says he's gonna get even with Farley Flockenhocker for killing his buddy Clayton Heffelflecker. Huh? Well, I heard it from old Doc Peckerchecker. You better tell Sheriff Dick Licker to get his ass on the line. Oh, there's gonna be hell to pay when Marshall Dingleberry comes back in town. Hey, there goes that dance hall girl, Fanny Clip Picker. Let's go get laid. Let's go get laid. Let's go get laid. I got one more of these funny names and we'll put a button on things. And that, this one's also from the Old West, but it has a kind of legendary background. Did you ever hear this idea that there were certain Indians in the Old West who were named for the first thing they saw when they were born? Makes you wonder why there aren't more Indians named Wet Hairy Pussy, doesn't it? <laughs> You'd think there'd be a whole gang of those motherfuckers, wouldn't you? <laughs> Apparently the name never caught on. Thanks for coming in here tonight. I do appreciate it. I hope I'll see you again sometime.